관련된 서명운동을 펼치고 있습니다 많은 분들이 행사 기간 동안 참여해주고 계시는데요 혹시 참여하지 못하신 분들은 오늘 중에서 오늘, 오늘이라도 참여해 주실 수 있으시면 감사하겠습니다 2023 강주 민주포럼 5월 17일 행사를 시작하도록 하겠습니다. 오늘은 세계 인권 옹호자 연대의 날이라는 타이틀 아래 진행되는 행사들입니다. 첫 번째 세션은 인권 옹호자에 대한 도전과 과제라고 명명하여 진행되는 세션입니다. 자장이신 안진 교수님께 마이크를 넘기도록 하겠습니다. 예, yeah. it's third day of Gwangju Democracy Forum 2023 today. We're g o n n a have preliminary session two, titled "The Day of Solidarity of Democracy and International Human Rights Defenders." Yeah, let me introduce myself. My name is Jin An, and I'm a law professor at Jeonnam uh, National University, located here. Yeah. I was a senior student uh, at the time the Gwangju uprising occurred. Oh. Yeah. That's why I am uh, a little bit excited to be here today. Yeah, I have been teaching human rights law and policy and human rights movement. And my specialty is on uh, feminist movement and gender issues. So as a um, sociologist of law, my PhD is not legal studies, but sociology. So, yeah. Let me talk about ground rule. Um, yeah, we're gonna have a keynote speech uh, about for 10 minutes, and we're gonna have three uh, presentation of three panels. Each panel has uh, 20 or 25 minutes. But I'm glad to hear uh, from Mr. James Hinan. Uh, he would like to uh, have a short presentation. 
to have uh, the wonderful discussion for the audience. I was very glad to hear that. So, and then after the presentation, we're going to have a kind of discussion. And many audience in the floor uh, raise a question and make any comment for the uh, discussion. So, yeah, let me get started. Uh, preliminary session two. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, Commissioner of OHCHL uh, in the United Nations. Uh, is going to open our session through uh, its video message. Uh, I'm so sorry uh, for him not to be here. Probably next year he's going to be here uh, because we're going to have a 40 anniversary of 18 uh, uprising um, memorial foundation. So, yeah. So, uh, let me introduce uh, High Commissioner Mr. Volker Trick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, let me introduce uh, his background and um, what he has been working. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chirk has been working for the refugees and he also worked uh, for the human rights policy and the strategy coordination at the Office of uh, Secretary General in the United Nations. Yeah, please welcome Mr. Chirk, our High Commissioner, by applause. How can we see the chairperson of the May 18 Foundation, Won Sun Siok, excellencies, human rights defenders from around the globe, colleagues and friends, friends. Warm greetings to you all. It is a pleasure to address you. I want to begin by acknowledging the work of the human rights defenders that are here today. I'm moved by your courage and inspired by your determination and willpower. Standing up for human rights, especially in the face of injustice, discrimination and oppression, is a Herculean task. It is essential to the progress of our societies. As you know, this year we mark the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We have an opportunity to revive its spirit and its ambitions for solidarity, equality, justice, and respect. To use the common language of human rights to better address humanity's most pressing challenges and to deliver on the promises the Universal Declaration made for a better future. The Declaration of Human Rights Defenders also celebrates its 25th year. At the heart of both anniversaries lies your work to translate human rights into tangible change in people's lives. It is you who ensure that people know what human rights mean in practice, you who ensure every article of the Universal Declaration has a specific meaning that resonates with people who face injustice and discrimination. It is you who hold the powerful to account. Every person who benefits from your efforts Every perpetrator brought to justice is a victory for your work and, most importantly, a victory for human dignity. As you know, the environment in which you conduct your work is filled with obstacles. Globally, we are seeing disturbing trends of shrinking civic space where human rights defenders, civil society and journalists, particularly women, face mounting surveillance, threats, arbitrary detention and physical attacks. And the result is often a self-enforced censorship under fear of violence, reprisals and intimidation. This month, as part of our initiative to mark the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration and to use it to achieve concrete progress, my office is spotlighting civic space. 
The civic space we all want is safe, free and open. I have called on states to protect the rights and work of human rights defenders, of civil society and journalists, and to ensure the voices of everyone everywhere are heard and taken into account in governance and institution building. Colleagues, this forum is a symbol of the spirit of human rights, and Guangzhou itself is a symbol of the power of grassroots action. It was here that the Guangzhou Student Independence Movement of 1929 helped trigger strong nationwide resistance to imperialism. Here in 1980, where citizens rose up against an authoritarian regime demanding their fundamental rights and say in their futures. I honor the memory of the hundreds who lost their lives in these struggles. Their legacy is freedom. Over the past years, Guangzhou's citizens have championed the role of human rights cities as great protectors of human rights. And all over Asia, human rights movements have transformed countries and alerted the world to injustice, inspiring transitions to democracy here in the Republic of Korea, the Philippines, Indonesia and Nepal, to name just a few. In more recent years, we have seen striking and creative forms of peaceful protests from young people across the region, demanding their rights, often at risk of severe reprisals. Let me pay special tribute and express solidarity to the courageous young activists in Myanmar and the women human rights defenders in Afghanistan. Of course, challenges remain, not least the lack of an effective regional human rights mechanism, contrary to all other continents, which results in diminished accountability and even impunity. Colleagues, I see three areas where more and more coordinated transformative actions are needed to safeguard and expand civic space in Asia and around the world. First, we need to mobilize people working to promote and protect human rights, renewing the spirit that led to the Universal Declaration and the Declaration of Human Rights Defenders. My office will expand its efforts to bring human rights allies to the table and to celebrate and shine the light on the work of human rights defenders. Second, we need a grand scale-up of efforts to protect human rights defenders at risk. Many protection networks and civil society organizations are already conducting remarkable work to reduce the risks to defenders, but they cannot do it alone. We urgently need stronger innovation in our protection and prevention strategies. We have many new tools available, better disaggregated data and better technology to identify people at risk. It is urgent that we harness it for good so that defenders can conduct their essential work free from fear. And third, we need more forceful and united calls for safe and open civic space both online and offline. A safe and open civic space that is inclusive and celebrates diversity and that incorporates an age, an age and gender sensitive approach. Civic space is the litmus test for governments in this anniversary year. By strengthening the space for debate, by increasing access to information, by implementing accountability mechanisms and through a genuine recognition of the role of civil society actors, especially women, human rights defenders and journalists, governments can meet this test. The judiciary can also play an important role in the defense of civic space, and I encourage them to review cases and legislation in light of international human rights obligations that states have assumed. Colleagues, human rights defenders are an integral part of the Human Rights 75 initiative and the spirit of solidarity and unity that we hope to reinvigorate. My office and I will do our best to support and accompany you in your journey to effect change. Thank you for your tireless and invaluable work. Yeah, thank you for the um, video message. Yeah, he suggests his three uh, uh, key kind of action uh, guidance. 
but uh, its keyword is uh, civic space, I think. So, yeah. Mm. Uh, I really miss him. He's not here. So, uh, next year, uh, I'm really expecting uh, to have a here for this wonderful uh, democracy forum next year. So, Mm. Uh, could you make a promise to us? <laughs> but but he's, 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 not, he, he's not able to reply. <laughs> so, yeah. And we're going to start uh, the presentation of three panels. Yeah. yeah first panel uh, is James Hinnan. Is chairperson of uh, High Commissioner, the Office of High Commissioner in Seoul. So, let me introduce him. Mm. Yeah, uh, he was uh, he, he, he was worked uh, at the High Commissioner in Palestine in Cambodia. People coming to Seoul in 2022. Yeah. And while he has been working uh, for the human rights for 25 years, uh, he supported um, the many human rights uh, treaty organizations, such as CEDAW uh, Committee, Children's Rights Committee, and Immigrant Workers Committee, and Committee for the uh, Persons with Disability. Yeah, I'm very glad. Uh, he also has an academic career. He was a law professor and a lawyer in, yeah. He worked in uh, United, uh, UK and Australia, so. Yeah, he has a uh, specialty in criminal law and uh, cooperation law. So, yeah, he's going to have a presentation for 12 or 15 minutes. And his manuscript is very compact, uh, but uh, it's going to try to um, save our time for the audience. So, and please welcome. Um, Mr. Hinan, by applause. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, members of the May 18 Foundation, colleagues, friends, um, thank you very much. I'm very honoured and humbled to be here uh, speaking today in this, you know, this human rights city of, of Guangzhou. Uh, the name of this city is synonymous with with democracy and human rights well beyond the Republic of Korea. And I join the High Commissioner uh, in honouring the memory of the hundreds of people who lost their lives in the struggle for human rights in this city, very just outside these doors. Indeed, freedom is their legacy. The High Commissioner could not be here uh, and sends his apologies, but uh, maybe next year. Let's see. I can't promise, but maybe next year. Uh, we have a group of inspirational human rights defenders here today. I'm embarrassed to be speaking first. I should be speaking last with my colleagues on the panel here. Um, uh, they, uh, they and all human rights defenders are doing the most valuable human rights work, which is standing up for rights at the local level, in communities, and at the national level. This, as you all know, this is where change happens. It's also where mo the vast majority of the threats against human rights defenders come from. But solutions to human rights problems, as we all know, should be found at the local level. Lo I mean, when I say local, I mean local and, and national level. The international level, where states come together, the role is to set some standards that can be used locally and to act as a sort of avenue of last resort when the national systems are not effective. 
uh, and the role of organisations like mine, the United Nations, particularly the Human, Human Rights Office, is to support and protect human rights defenders and help put in place effective national protection systems. I want to briefly mention what we do here in Seoul because people might say, well, you've had the High Commissioner, why have you got this other guy from the same organisation? Our role in Seoul, our role in DPRK is 100% focused on the human rights situation in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, which is commonly called North Korea. That's the mandate given to us, that's what we've been asked to do. We, we, we monitor, we document, we analyse and we publicly report on the human rights situation in DPRK. We work with victims to hear their views and we look for pathways for accountability for international crimes. In, in fact, if the North Korean government didn't object, as they do, uh, I would be sitting in Pyongyang like a normal UN human rights office. We would be in the country, working in the country. Our work builds on the, the famous Commission of Inquiry 10 years ago on human rights in DPRK. As with all offices of the UN Human Rights Organization, we work, we focus on human rights defenders and civil society space. There are a large number of human rights defenders working to improve the human rights situation in DPRK. Many are here in, in the Republic of Korea, but they exist in countries around the world, particularly where there are large communities of North Koreans. Um, these are people, as you all are, who have decided to stand up for the human rights of others. Many of the human rights defenders we have working on North Korea are victims themselves. They're people who have been subject to serious human rights violations and have escaped DPRK. They use their new, they use their new found freedom to, to advocate for the rights of those still in DPRK and they bring a very rare and clear view into the daily lives of people in DPRK. We also have people who, they've escaped DPRK, but they also speak up for the rights of North Koreans living in other countries, including the Republic of Korea, but other countries, the United States, Japan, the United Kingdom, and elsewhere. We also have human rights defenders who have had a family member subject to serious human rights violations. A good example is uh, organisations led by people who have had a father or a mother or a son or a daughter who have been enforceably disappeared uh, by DPRK. Those people uh, have worked almost their whole lives to try to find not just the truth for their own loved one, but also to stand up for the rights of others in seeking truth. One, one strange thing about DPRK, about working in human rights on DPRK, and I've worked in many countries, is that there is neither an independent civil society nor civic space in the country. In other contexts where we work from outside the country, like Myanmar or Syria, um, we can rely on a network of NGOs and human rights defenders in the country. We can call them up, get their views, find out what's happening, uh, and, and through them provide information and assistance. That doesn't exist in DPRK. There is no civic space. There are no independent civil society organisations. It's one of the few countries like that. But while there might be no civic space in North Korea, there certainly are human rights defenders. Uh, they might know that they are human rights defenders, but they are and I salute them. Um, we talked earlier about how human rights solutions should be found at the national level, but in some countries, the national level protection systems aren't working, and we're gonna talk about those here today, I think. Um, it makes little sense saying to human rights defenders in a country like, well, like North Korea, go and ask the national authorities to help you because the systems don't exist. Our role is to help build those systems of protection. Our role is to get the information and provide the recommendations so that those systems to protect people like you, to protect human rights defenders, 
are set up. Um, part of that is advocacy. We advocate for the rights of human rights defenders. Uh, uh, and we, we focus also on, on accountability and seeking a right to remedy for victims, but ultimately we're trying to improve situations. It's about building better societies. It's about setting up the protection systems that we need, and that's what we're trying to do in DPRK, although it will take a long time. The High Commissioner mentioned his vision about supporting human rights defenders in the future. One of the levers he mentioned this year are some anniversaries. Now, we have anniversaries every year. We have lots of anniversaries in the human rights sphere. There's always an anniversary of some convention or another. But this year, the two documents, the UDHR, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the Declaration of Human Rights Defenders, these documents are really foundational for protecting human rights defenders. As the High Commissioner said to the Council last year, he said, with an eye to the past as well as to the future, in the spirit of never again, and in the interest of intergenerational justice, it's critical that we rekindle the spirit, the impulse and the vitality that led to the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights 75 years ago. The idea is to try to go back to that time, long time ago, 1948, to try to rekindle that sense between nations in particular and people that led to that document being adopted. I'm, I, I'm, I'm a bit sorry to say that if we tried to draft such a document again today, we wouldn't succeed. I can't see the consensus globally on such a document these days. So what we can do is we can try to go back and rekindle that spirit of 1948. The 25th anniversary of the Declaration on Human Rights Defenders is also an opportunity to talk about the challenges for human rights defenders, and we're going to talk about those here today, but also to talk about the huge successes that have come from the work of human rights defenders, improving literally the lives of millions, tens of millions of people. And the work is, which many of you do, it's, it's not, it, it's outside the limelight, it's not high profile, it's hard work. Um, but as the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders, who was also speaking, um, said this year to celebrate the declaration, she said, human rights defenders all over the world, in democracies and dictatorships, in cities, in forests, in deserts, are achieving huge success, often in the face of terrible danger. And she, she dedicates her report to these huge successes. Um, I commend you to read the report. I commend us all to look at the successes of the human rights uh, movement here on the peninsula of Korea in particular, um, because sometimes when we talk about human rights, things can get a little bit depressing. The story of here, of Gwangju, of May 18, is probably one of the greatest examples of the determination of human rights defenders and what they can achieve. What they did was is, continues to be inspirational for, for, for many people. They, they, built, they were building on a strong historical human rights culture in this city. Human rights defenders were and are exemplary in, in, in the key, the building blocks of being a human rights defender, standing up to oppression with, at great personal danger, uh, for, form, formulating and organizing clear goals clear human rights goals, yeah, in human rights terms, um, being inclusive and participatory, not being exclusive, uh, showing phenomenal determination and tenacity in not letting go of the claim for justice um, over decades. Like, I read the story of Guangzhou again last night. Decades of work, and eventually it came. Not perfectly, but it came. Uh, memorialising and truth-telling so that the story is not forgotten, which is what we're doing here and what we're doing here these days, but also, finally, following a path of reconciliation. So there's no better place to be talking about the role and the achievements, the positive achievements of human rights defenders than here in Guangzhou. There are many new generation uh, challenges we have at the moment. The challenges change in every generation. The new generation of human rights defenders have to face very different challenges. 
technology, including the rise of artificial intelligence, just in the last, it feels like it's just the last month, all of a sudden artificial intelligence is something that we're, we're ringing the alarm bells about. Accelerating climate change, aging populations, particularly in this part of the world. Um, these new challenges join persistent challenges, conflict, racism, that just will not go away. The ability of human rights defenders not only to exist, but to express their opinions and criticise those in power is key to challenging, to addressing these challenges, and you all know that. I promise not to speak too long, so I won't, Madam Chairperson. I'd just like to uh, 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 hear more from our impressive human rights defenders here today. And let me again thank the May 18 Foundation for inviting us to speak uh, during these solemn days uh, in the great city of Guangzhou. Kamsamida. Uh, thank you for the uh, wonderful presentation. Mm, I'm really glad to save our time. <laughs> so, yeah, he tried to. Uh, he shortened his presentation. So. Mm -hmm. Let me introduce uh, the second panel, uh, lawyer Soa Lee. Yeah, he has been, she has been um, working as a pro bono lawyer uh, in Gwangju Jeonnam area. The non-profit organization named uh, Tongheng Companion. Yeah. Uh, he also worked for the uh, Association of Democratic Lawyer, which is the, uh, the symbol of a human rights group of legal professionals in Korea. Uh, She's going to share her experience uh, at the local level uh, as a pro bono lawyer uh, to make the international solidarity for the human rights defenders. Yep. Uh, please welcome lawyer Soa Lee. I'm very glad to see her wearing a Korean traditional costume. This is the first time to see her wearing a Korean traditional costume. Yeah. 네. 여기 와 보니 저만 한국어로 발표를 하는 것 같아서 만약에 다음에도 이런 자리에 초대가 된다면 제가 영어로 발표를 준비하도록 하겠습니다. 네. 저 아마 저의 한국어를 영어로 번역하시, 통역해서 말씀하시는 것이 더 어려울 것으로 추측이 되므로 저는 이 발제문에서 특별하게 벗어나지 않는 선에서 발표를 하도록 하겠습니다. 네, 저는 공익 변호사와 함께하는 동행이라는 NGO에 2015년에 설립된 NGO의 상금 변호사로 있고요. 저희는 지역에서 어, 존엄과 권리를 상실한 이들의 목소리를 법의 언어로 전달한다는 지향으로 일하고 있습니다. 여기까지만 발제문에 없는 내용을 말씀드리고 이후, 이하에는 어, 아마 영어 자료집은 95쪽인 것 같고요. 한글 자료집은 81쪽인 것 같습니다. 여러분은 95쪽 이하에 있는 발제문을 참조하시면 될것 같습니다. 네. 제 발제문이 한글로 훨씬 더 풍부하게 이해될 수 있을 텐데 어, 아쉬운 부분이 있네요. 왜냐하면 제목에 당사자의 곁에서 끈질기게 방법을 모색하는 지역 인권 옹호자들의 얼굴 이렇게 써 있었거든요. 근데 아마 이 모든 각각의 단어가 한글, 한국어가 영어로 번역되기는 쉽지 않았을 것으로 생각이 됩니다. 아무튼 네, 광주 전남에는 성폭력, 성매매, 인신매매, 노동, 장애, 아동, 성소수자, 뭐 일제 강제 노무동원 피해자 등 여러 존엄과 권리를 상실한 이들의 곁에서 
짧게는 1, 2년, 길게는 30년이 넘게 일하는 많은 인권 활동가들이 있습니다. 저는 이 자리에 단지 그냥 변호사라는 자격증이 있다는 이유만으로 그분들을 대신해서 말할 기회를 얻었을 뿐이라고 생각합니다. 일개 변호사로서 제가 민주주의의 회복과 방향성 이런 주제로 거시적인 담론을 얘기할 능력은 없습니다. 다만 지난 8년간 광주에서 지역 광주에서 여러 방면의 활동가들의 활동을 보면서 느꼈던 것들을 여러분에게 꼭 전하고 싶습니다. 먼저 이제 제가 활동하는 동행에 대해서 설명할 필요가 있는데요. 동행은 광주 전남의 유일한 근데 유일하고 싶지는 않은 비영리 전업 방식으로 일하는 어, 단체입니다. 2015년 5월에 설립이 됐고 딱만 8년이 되었습니다. 지금 이런 방식으로 일하는 변호사들을 한국에서는 공익 전업 풀타임 변호사로 이렇게 말, 말합니다. 공익 전업 변호사 이렇게 말하는데요. 놀랍게도 대한민국에는 이런 방식으로 일하는 변호사들이 150명이 넘게 있습니다. 그런데 그 150명이 넘게 일하는 변호사들이 어, 한 서너 명을 빼고 다 서울 경기 지역에만 있습니다. 네, 지금 동행이 매우 드물고 소중한 곳이라는 것을 말하는 것이 아닙니다. 지역에 저희가 내려와서 동행을 만들기 전에도 이미 그 전부터 지금도 앞으로도 계속 당사자들의 곁에서 일해왔던 훌륭한 인권 활동가들이 지역 인권 활동가들이 있었기 때문에 그 이전에도 지금도 어, 당사자들의 목소리가 법의 언어로 전달될 수 있었던 것이죠. 동행은 그냥 2015년에 우연히 설립됐을 뿐입니다. 네, 이제 그래서 광주 전남에서 일하는 당사자들의 어, 일하는 활동가들의 어, 놀라운 활동들을 어, 아마 여러분의 자료집 95쪽에 있는 내용으로 사진을 중심으로 설명을 드리겠습니다. 네, 95쪽에 있는 첫 번째 여성 네, 사진은 경우 사진은 어떤 사진이냐면요. 2015년에 여수 전남 여수에 있는 어, 어느 유흥주점에서 성매매 피해 여성이 사망한 사건이 있었습니다. 근데 이제 그때 그 여성이 사망했을 때 광주의 언니네 상담소라고 하는 NGO가 있어요. 성매매 피해 여성을 위한 NGO입니다. 그 NGO 활동가들이 3년간, 3년 동안 <웃음> 실체적인 진실을 밝히기 위해서 끊임없이 어, 재판 모니터링 뿐만 아니라 당사자들 그때 그 사망 사건의 진실을 밝히기 위해서 나와준 동료 9명의 동료들의 모든 어, 일상생활 지원까지 하여서 그렇게 끈질기게 지원을 하여 업주가 이례적으로 구속 수사를 받고 왜 구속이 안 될까 생각이 들 수도 있는데요. 아무튼 업주가 매우 이례적으로 구속되어서 수사를 받고 업주에게 징역형이 선고되는 성, 성과를 거뒀습니다. 저희는 더 놀랍다고 생각하는 성과는 당시 아홉 명의 동료 여성들이 탈업소하여서 지금도 어, 간간히 안부를 전하면서 지내고 있습니다. 그래서 그, 그 사진 첫 번째 사진 세 명의 여성이 회의를 하고 있는 게 보이시죠? 어, 광주의 언니네 상담소뿐만 아니라 여러 성매매 피해 여성을 지원하는 단체 활동가 분들인데요. 맨 왼쪽에 최숙희 가운데 김희영 맨 오른쪽이 김정연 활동가입니다. 네, 그리고 96쪽으로 넘어가서 이제 장애인, 전남 장애인 노동력 착취 사건에 대해서 들어보신 분도 있을 것이고 아닌 분도 있을 텐데요. 전남의 염전에서 계속 반복적으로 장애인 노동력 착취 사건이 일어나고 있습니다. 그래서 재작년에도 보도가 있었고요. 2014년에도 보도가 있었는데요. 그러면 그 보도가 있, 있는 때만 그런 노동력 착취 사건이 있지, 있는 것이 아닙니다. 그 보도가 있든 없든 노동력 착취 사건은 사실은 지금도 일어나고 있고 그 전에도 일어나고 있고 슬프게도 아마 앞으로도 있을 텐데요. 이런 장애인 노동력 착취 문제에 대해서 전남에 있는 장애인 인권 활동가들이 
전남은 굉장히 섬이 많습니다. 나중에 놀러 가 보시면 아실 텐데요. 그 모든 전남의 섬들을 다 돌면서 구석구석 다니면서 계속해서 염전과 뭐 섬과 뭐 이런 곳에서 고립되어 있는 당사자들의 곁을 장애 당사자들의 곁을 지켰던 활동가들이 있었기 때문에 이 사건이 이렇게 보도가 되고 저희가 법률 지원을 할수 있었던 것입니다. 97쪽에 있는 사진을 보시면 그 전남 장애인 차별 철폐 연대라고 하는 연대체가 있습니다. 그 차별 철폐 연대 활동가들이 염전에 있는 주민들에게 직접 가서 어, 네, 인권 관련된 설명을 하고 있는 교육 중인 그런 염전 밭이에요. 여기가 교육 중인 그런 사진이고요. 그리고 이제 그 아래에 있는 두 개의 사진은 꼭 염전 사건과 관련된 것은 아니지만 어, 광주의 왼쪽에는 배영준 활동가 오른쪽에는 광주의 장애인 어, 부모연대 어, 활동가들이 여러 가지 기자회견을 하는 활동의 모습입니다. 각각 광주지방법원과 광주광역시청 앞에서 기자회견을 했던 모습입니다. 네, 그리고 98쪽으로 넘어가시면 네, 98쪽에 보시면 이제 어, 한 명이 있죠. 마이크 앞에. 광주장애인권익옹호기관의 박찬동 활동가입니다. 2016년에 저희가 한국에 이제 장애인활동지원법이라는 게 있어요. 네, 너무 복, 법률적으로 복잡한 내용은 빼고 장애인활동지원법에 어떤 문제가 있습니다. 법률 자체에 문제가 있, 있습니다. 그런 문제가 있는데 그 문제 때문에 장애가 있음에도 불구하고 활동지원 서비스를 받지 못하는 당사자분이 계셨어요. 황신혜 님이시고요. 근데 이제 이렇게 장애가 있는 당사자분들은 법적인 소송을 하기, 하지 못하십니다. 왜냐하면 너무 힘드니까요. 길고 어, 이길지 질지 모르는 그 싸움에 자신의 삶을 걸 수는 없으니까 이제 활동 이런 소송을 아예 포기하고 있었습니다. 근데 이제 이런 박찬동 활동가를 비롯한 광주 장애인권 활동가들의 지속적이고 친밀한 라포 형상으로 결국에 소송을 시작할 수 있었고요. 그 소송은 5년이 걸렸습니다. 4년인가? 5년인가 걸렸고요. 그래서 이제 결국에 헌법 불합치 결정을 이끌어낸 결과를 얻었습니다. 박찬동 활동가 등 활동가들의 이그 당사자의 곁을 지키지 않았다면 이 소송 자체는 시작할 수가 없었던 것이죠. 그리고 이제 99쪽에 넘어가시면 웬 조, 조끼를 입은 사람들이 기자회견을 하고 있는 걸 보실 텐데요. 이제 여수 거문도에서 어 지금 한국도 여러 이주 이제 각 아시아의 각 지역에서 이주 노동자 분들이 오셔서 일을 하고 계시는데 어그 이주 노동자 분들이 현장에서 많은 차별을 겪습니다. 그, 그, 체불링 임금을 제대로 받지 못해서 노동청에 진정을 했는데, 담당 공무원의 무책임한 대응으로, 어, 그, 진정이 취하된 경우가 있었어요. 이제 이거를 저희가 발견을 하고, 광주에 있는 또 광주 전남 이주 노동자 인권 네트워크라고 하는 연대체가 있습니다. 네트워크가 있는데, 그각 네트워크에는 각 노동조합의 활동가들, 그리고 지역의 인권단체 등이 연대하여 있는데요. 주로 노동조합에서 큰 역할을 하고 있습니다. 그 아래 사진은 그각 노동조합의 뭐 류인근 활동과 어 홍관희 노무사님, 문길주 선생님, 그리고 금속노조의 여러 활동가들의 사진이 있습니다. 저희가 이제 그래서 그때도 어 기자회견을 여수 노동청 앞에 가서 해서 이겼고요. 그리고 그 다음에 2020년에는 어떤 일이 있었냐면 양식장에서 어 일을 하던 업 이주 노동자가 포르말린을 사용했던 모양입니다. 포르말린 사용으로 백혈병이 파, 발견, 발병되었습니다. 근데 사실 이런 경우에 산업재해가 인정되기가 상당히 많이 어렵습니다. 왜냐하면 인과관계를 증명하기가 어렵고 그 인과관계를 증명하는 시간 동안 당사자에게 버티라고 할수 없으니까요. 그런데 이제 어, 류인근 활동가가 당사자 곁에서 계속해서 병원 지원, 생활 지원 등등등 여러 가지 지원을 계속해서 포기하지 않고 해내어 
최근에 이 백혈병이 산업재해로 인정이 되는 결과를 얻었습니다. 그래서 후속 대응을 하려고 하고 있습니다. 네, 백쪽으로 넘어가시면 제가 이제 아까 안진 교수님께서 제가 민변에서 일을 했다고 말씀하셨는데요. 민변 어, 민주사회를 위한 변호사 모임은 본부가 서울에 있고 저도 이제 광주에서 내려오기 전에는 서울에서 활동을 했습니다. 그쪽 그때는 주로 어, 국회를 상대로 법률을 바꾸는 활동을 했습니다. 입법 대응을 주로 했습니다. 그런 입법 대응이나 이런 것들이 뭔가 큰 변화를 일으킨다 하는 그런 생각을 했었습니다. 근데 이제 그런 거시적인 변화에만 주목하는 것이 그런 주목하는 서울 중심의 엘리트주의적인 사고 방식이 어, 이 지역에서의 개개의 인권 사건을 어, 지원하는 데 얼마나 큰 착각이고 오만이었는가 하는 것을 지난 8년 동안 내내 겪고 있고 앞으로도 계속 그런 뼈아픈 저의 착오는 계속해서 어, 반성을 할 계획으로 있습니다. 예를 들자면 이제 장, 재작년 말 2021년에 장애인 노동력 착취 문제가 다시 언론을 탔습니다. 서울의 활동가가 저에게 이런 말을 해요. 아니 2014년에도 기자 서울에서 기자회견 하곤 해, 했는데 왜 전남은 바뀌지 않는가 하고 이제 서울에 있는 활동가들이 얘기를 합니다. 물론 이제 제도의 변화만큼 지역이 빨리 바뀌지 않는 것은 뭐 저도 아쉬운 부분이 있죠. 그렇지만 그와 같은 질문을 하는 서울의 활동가들 중 누구도 사실 전남에서 살진 않지 않습니까? 그 지역에서 살면서 당사자의 곁에서 어 문제를 바꾸기 위해 여러 가지 방법들을 끊임없이 생각해내고 어 행동하는 것이 결국의 변화의 시작입니다. 큰 제도가 바뀌는 것이 구체적인 개인의 삶의 변화에 바로 직결되지는 않습니다. 큰 제도의 변화 말고 바로 그것이 구체적인 당사자의 삶의 변화를 일으키기 위해서 옆에 누군가 있는 것 그것이 인권활동가들이 해야 할 일이고 어, 가장 빛나는 순간이라고 생각하는데요. 아무튼 2014년에 그렇게 서울에서 기자회견을 했다고 해서 전남의 상황이 바뀌지 않죠. 근데 2021년에는 전남의 활동가들이 주축이 되어서 전라남도와 어, 전라남도경찰청, 그리고 검찰청 등을 계속, 상대로 지금도 계속해서 무언가를 끊임없이 어, 시도를 하고 있고 작은, 작지만 큰 변화들을 앞으로도 지금도 이루어 가려고 하고 있습니다. 어, 농, 농민 문제도 마찬가지다 하는 것을 말씀을 잠깐 드리고 넘어가고요. 네, 지역 인권 옹호자들이 이런 큰 변화가 지역에 어, 네, 지역에 왜큰 제도적인 변화는 있는데 왜 그게 구체적인 지역의 개인의 변화와는 관계가 없는가와 관련된 이런 질문들을 겪 견디면서 지역에 있는 당사자들 곁에서 지역 공동체 속에서 그리고 어느 누구의 목소리도 배제되지 않도록 잡을 찾아가는 여정을 계속, 계속 견디고 있고 이런 부분과 관련돼서 찾아보니까 유엔 인권, 인권 옹호자 선언 제가 이거 풀네임을 외우지는 못해서요 인권 옹호자 선언에도 지역의 여러 가지 어, 활동가들의 그 활동을 독려하는 부분과 관련된 조항이 있더라고요. 16조에 보면 뭐 개인, 비정부 기구 등은 해당 사회 및 지역 사회의 다양한 배경을 고려하여 뭐 여러 가지 중요한 역할을 담당하고 있다. 이런 내용이 있고 18조에도 어, 지역 사회에 대하여 지역 사회 내에서 수행해야 할 의무가 있다. 이런 내용들이 있었습니다. 찾아보니까. 네, 그랬습니다. 나가면서 이제 이렇게 지역에 있는 인권 공동체 속에서 당사자들의 곁을 구축하고 민주인권적인 변화를 끊임없이 모색하는 지역에 있는 인권 옹호 활동가들에게 깊은 연대의 박수를 보냅니다. 그리고 여기 계신 분들도 자신의 집으로 자신의 나라로 돌아가서는 어, 더 지역에 관심을 가지시면 좋겠다라고 생각을 합니다. 
그리고 이제 최근에 노동조합에 대한 한국 정부의 탄압이 심해지고 있습니다. 그래서 전방위적인 수, 수사로 인하여 건설 노동조합의 양해동 활동가가 어, 사망하신 사건이 있었는데요. 양해동 선생님의 영혼에 평안이 깃들길 바라면서 이만 바치도록 하겠습니다. 네, thank you for the wonderful presentation by lawyer uh, So uh, Lee. Uh, she introduced four examples uh, while she has been uh, working as a pro bono lawyer to provide uh, pro bono legal services. And she emphasized the uh, human rights activist, the support of human rights activist and uh, solidarity, the importance of solidarity. So you have, I think you have many questions uh, to listen to her uh, examples like uh, sex trafficking victims or uh, the labor exploitation uh, of intellectual uh, disability and the, the immigrant workers at the, the fish farm. So, uh, yeah, keep your uh, questions and comment after all the presentation. So. And let me introduce uh, the last panel, uh, Shiba Amelirad. So she um, just arrived uh, here last night. I think she's still suffering for jet lag. She's still <laughs> uh, adapting to the time difference. Uh, she has been working as a labor movement and feminist movement uh, before uh, coming to move into Canada. Uh, she was uh, uh, the regional representative of a teachers union in Iran. Uh, and she is working for the victims of state violence, especially uh, the victims suffering from trauma because she's a psychologist. She's not just a human rights activist, but a psychologist. Uh, yep, that's all. And uh, you're gonna have 20 minutes or would you like to have longer time? Yeah, uh, she's going to have uh, about 20 minutes for the presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, welcome uh, activist Shiba uh, Amelirad, uh, by applause. Greeting and solidarity from my organization, Coordinating Council of Iranian Trade Teacher Association. I am very happy. Thank you for having me here. With all this presentation that I heard, I was thinking if I want to point of the human right in Iran, <laughs> it's better for like at this time to point what kind of human right we have in Iran. Actually, I can say it's not exaggeration. I can say we have nothing there. But if I want to talk about those human rights that are not protected by government, I need hours and hours, unfortunately. I'm trying to bring a brief example of the situation in Iran. 
We all know how crucial are for international human rights. I would like to address the international covenant of economic, social, and cultural rights, and also the international and the civil and political rights in the context, context of Iran. Iran has ratified both Convenant. However, I should highlight it, the deep concern that the Iranian government has zero commitment in the implementing them. Also, I should emphasize the tragic condition of the human rights in Iran, where the economic and political situation is far from being acceptable. In the following, I would depict a picture of the human rights situation in Iran. To begin with, the LGBTQ plus community is a group which has suffered the most in the hand of the state in Iran. The heteronormative policies are simply too oppressive to tolerate any form of expression of the LGBT plus community, let alone accepting their fundamental rights. The general condition of the human rights in Iran has been alarming for quite a while. However, the oppressing experience by women is simply something intolerable. Honor killing, incarceration, I mean the violation of the state, defined the dress code, discriminatory policies regarding the a judiciary right of women are just some example of violations against women's human rights. Furthermore, for making a clear image of the condition of human rights in Iran, it's crucial to acknowledge the diversity of the country. In Iran, various nations coexist, each with their own language, their own religion, and history. However, it's important to recognize that throughout the 20th century, the non-Persian nations have faced unbelievable form of oppression since the establishment of the modern nation state under the rule of Reza Shah Pahlavi in 1962 until today. Non-Persian nations have been targeted the central government in various forms, Kurds, Kurds Baluchis, Lur, Arab, Turk, Turkmen, and Gilak nation are among the principal non-Persian nation residing within in Iran borders. Uh, in the following, I'll provide a specific example that highlight the interest, intersection form of oppression experienced by the marginalized group in Iran. By shedding light this reality, we can better understand the complexity of human rights issue and work to, toward a more inclusive and equitable society. Workers, including teachers, face unstable livelihood and beneficial labor law that forever employers. Lack of safety measurement to workplace lead to injury and ever death every day. While many workers lack like insurance, independent trade union, unions, including those formed by the teachers and other workers, are suppressed. Access to free education is limited, is very limited, with millions of children unable to attend school due to economic difficulty. Higher education faces ever-increasing commercialization. In, the era, in Iran, the right of protest and freedom of expression are severely violated. The country has the higher number of the imprisoned journalists, hundreds of journalists are imprisoned simply because of covering human rights issue. Nilu Farhamedi and Elaha Mohammadi, two of them who covered the case of Jina Amini, I'm sure you heard her name, are just two of them. The Iranian writer associated face illegal treatment such as imprisonment and censorship. Feminists and women rights activists face brutal oppression. For instance, Kurdish feminist Zainab Jalalian was sentenced to life imprisonment 15 years ago and has been incarcerated since. Protest, protesters are met with their repression, resulting in death and arrest. 
prisoner experienced denial of the right, forced confession, torture, and limited access to information. Execution have also been used as a tool by Islamic Republic to suffer protesters. This crime dates back to the 1980, which tools the life approximately 11,000 individuals. In recent years, lots of political prisoners, including Farzad Kamangar, Ramin Hossein Panahi, Rehana Jabari, and lots of others, has been, have been executed. Farzad was a teacher in Kurdistan and was executed in capital. In many cases, including the case of Farzad, even the regime, the Iran government, does not deliver their body to, body of the executed to their family. The family even do not know where their beloved uh, is buried. Also, it's needed to mention that in the past 10 days alone, more than 58 people are executed for 10 days only. State official studies showed that only last year 67, 617 prisoners were executed in Iran. Human rights activist documentation showed that the overwhelming percentage of the executed are among marginalized nations. It needed to be noted that more than 80% of these whole executions are from Balochistan. One of other things I want to bring in the very mention, the situation, I don't want to go to the details. The denial of the education in mother tongue is a, it's a very big issue in Iran. By exclusively using Persian as a language, as an instruction, diverse language background are neglected. And progress and violated the fundamental right to the education in one's mother, mother tongue. This lead to high drop rates among non-Persian students, resulting in negative consequences such as early marriage, teenager pregnancy, child labor, and discrimination. Religious discrimination. It is a grave issue in Iran. Both non-Muslims, such as Baha'i, Jewish, Christian, and Zartoshtis, but also the Sunni Muslim face oppression and discrimination to their different religious affiliation and <coughs> cannot have security and pressure. The Baha'i community suffered the most discrimination, being denied education, employment, and basic religious. This systematic discrimination violates the principle of the religious freedom and equality. Citizenship rights are denied in Baluchistan. Those that I mentioned, they have a higher rate of the ex um, um, uh, have been killed during that these last days. Sorry, I forgot the exact name. With many Baluchi individuals lacking breast certificate, demographic changes in non-Persian regime involving encouraging investment, military present, and settlement of non-indigenous community violating the right and identify of the oppressed community. Discrimination against immigration, immigrant, particularly the Afghan population in, in Iran. They are denied identity document. They are suffer from the so-called illegal residency status. They are denied education, access to public place, medical insurance, and even right to travel in the country. They are forced into low paying informal job without job security or social benefit. Their children are denied birth certificate and they are subjected to constant arrest and confinement of uh, in human camps. Uh, the Islamic Republic has neglected environmental protection a lot, and I'm gonna to pass some of this detail and go to the Jinjian Azadi, Women, Life, Freedom, Revolution, that's happened since September uh, 2022. 
In the aftermath of the September 16 uprising uh, triggered by the death of Gina Amini, a Kurdish girl from Sakhiz, Kurdistan, a wave of protests swept across the Iran. The government violent response to the mass protest movement resulting in the lose of over 600 lives, including a significant after the students and children, particularly from the marginalized nation minority. During the uprising, at least 70 children and high school students were killed, with close to 60% of these victims belonging to Kurdish, Kurdish and Baluchis community, two of the marginalized nation minority. The government security force were responsible for the death of two teachers in Sakhiz and Jawanrut, the Kurdish city. And additionally, four protesters were executed and approximately 20,000 people were arrested through the, uh, around the country. The government action, including the illegal detention of the protesters, the use of the torture and forced convention and the execution of the political prison, prisoners have been widely condemned. These protests and acts of solidarity reflect the determination of the Iranian people to demand justice, protect the right of all people who live in Iran, and put an end of government violence. The event of the September 16 uprising as a reminder of the ongoing struggle for equality and the recognition of the fundamental human right in Iran. The current uprising in Iran must, in the most countrywide protest since 1979, I believe. In my point of view of women's life, freedom revolution uprising has sounded this not only for the uh, auto autocratic regime is against patriarchy, but also of the Persian orientation conception in Iran. Do I have time to continue? Yes. Okay. Also, one very important situation that currently happened in Iran, it is on flooding in Iran where approximately 2,000 girls has been poisoned by toxic gas since November 2022. The affected girl from <coughs> respiratory problem, nations, and all lots of side effects, around 90 school affected so far. The CCITTA has informed that Iranian government has not considered this disaster as an urgent matter, despite approximately 600 female students be being taken to the hospital. Um. The statistics provided until now indicated that approximately 20, 230 schools have been affected across 25 provinces in the country. The realities of the Gaz Girls School has disputed the security of education girls' schools. CCITTA has condemned their action in the strong possible term to show their disposal of CCITTA organized the protests across the country against the guessing in the girls' school on March 7. Unfortunately, the protest was met with violence by security forces and number of teachers participating in the rally were arrested. I have more to share, but unfortunately, we don't have time. Unfortunately, Iran condition is very, very bad, and this is very simple thing that's happened during the last year. We have a lots of our activists, they are in prison forever. They don't have any right, they don't have any voice, and everything is going to work during this last year. Thank you so much. Thank you for the wonderful but gloomy presentation. When I listened to her presentation, that reminded me the Korean authoritarian regime during 1960s and the 1970s.
It sounds no judiciary system, no legal system. It's not really public in Iran. No. She's currently getting involved in uh, Jina revolution, I think. And okay, we had keynote speech and three presentations so far. Mm. It's time for the audience. Uh, is there any questions to the presenters? And any comment and any suggestion for the solidarity of human rights defenders? Oh, yeah. And if you raise your hand and could you pass the micro uh, microphone to her? Yeah. And please, uh, before uh, speaking, uh, introduce yourself for the audience. Uh, thank you very much. So my name is Fidril Sari from Indonesia. Uh, greeting solidarity for survivor of the Gwangju movement and uh, human rights defenders in the world. Uh, thank you very much for the speaker. It's really um, interesting for me for the topic. So I have some question. The first question I would like to propose to Ms. Uh, Sua. So Ali, about the migrant workers that that you explain about the migrant workers from East Timor and Pakistan that that experience human rights abuse, and how to advocate the migrant workers right here. So because there is a an irresponsible uh, official official officer here that that cannot handle the case. So how the your organization advocate for the migrant workers right does the organization also cooperate with ngo from the country of origins of the their nationality for instance country of origins in east timor or pakistan does the organization cooperate with ngo or also the government and the second i would like to propose for the miss sifa amarilan about the, that many people executed in the Iran, Iran, I mean. Uh, and then my question is how to advocate the, the people that there are so many people executed in the Iran, and is there any possibility to cooperate with the government? Yeah, we know that Iran is an authoritarian government, but is there any possibility to cooperate, like maybe using a religious approach? Because in Indonesia, there are also people, uh, Indonesian people executed in the Indonesian, uh, by the Indonesian government and civil society cooperate using the religious approach. Because uh, there is, life is, cannot be taken except by the God. And, uh, and to the continue, how the UN tackle the capital punishment that happened in the Iran? And uh, as we know here, like we are here, young people, how we can enforce with the movement? Is there any platforms for us to voicing these problems? Thanks so much. Thank you for the question. Uh, we're going to give you an answer and discussion after the, all the question and the comment. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Kaun, and I'm from Myanmar. And uh, first of all, I would like to ask Mr. James about the UN activity related to the DPRK. So you have discuss about the challenges and uh, what you have been doing. But what I want to know is what are the improvement of supporting the human rights defender in North Korea. So that's for you. And for Ms. Shiva, thank you for your presentation about the Iranian situations. And like, Myanmar people are also aware of what's happening in Iran. And I feel like 
the Iranian regime and Myanmar militaries are also like dictatorship alliance. So they have been closely working, like closely working together to oppress the citizen. And also, I, I also have the Iranian friends in my school, and we have been discussed about all these human rights violations. And uh, what I would like to know is, like, do you think, like, is there any likelihood that you can change the, the this, uh, this uh, last year, Masha Amni case, that that uprising, that can lead to a region change in Iran, or is there any likelihood that you can see region change in Iran from this uprising? And thank you. It, yeah, uh, was the next, the, the first line. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Annie Favo, I'm from Nigeria and I'm studying at Aju University here in Korea. So uh, thank you Ms. Shiva for your presentation and I have a question. So I would like to know how do the CSOs in Iran, because I know the CSOs they are monitored by the government, they are under uh, the oversight of the government, so how do they bypass this to ensure civic participation? How do they maintain the morale of participants? How do they build trust to know that, okay, someone, like someone in that particular movement won't report them to the government? Thank you. The, the woman at the first line. I would, uh, my name is Anshana Himimna, I'm from Thailand. I would like to ask Mr. James Hinan about the human rights defenders situation in Thailand. Uh, we, we have a problem attack uh, direct to the human rights defender, both on online and physical harm and law enforcement. Uh, and in my, in my experience, I sent the my case to the court, and the, I was attacked by online, by the government. And my case, the court said that this is a psychologist torture, but uh, the government or the court cannot uh, access who, 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 who are perpetrators. That is the problem. And also, I think in my room, my friends, human rights defender from Thailand also was attacked by 112 article and uh, slap law, like uh, defamation and computer crime act in Thailand. And we also send many communication to the UN mechanism already. And uh, last time I visited the Geneva office and we said that uh, they cannot do anything uh, to uh, pressure the Thai government uh, any, uh, any uh, mechanism in Thai to change the situation about human rights defender in Thailand. And also, if the human rights defender not have a famous name in Thailand, they were affected by physical harm or uh, disappearance. Uh, can you recommend us what we should do for the next step to protect and prevent uh, and human rights defender from attack by the government side? Thank you. We don't have enough time. And one more person for the question. Ah, I'm sorry, the right person. So. Thank you very much for the challenge. Uh, I'm Ganis from Indonesia. I want to deliver my question for Ms. Sue Ali. Sue Ali, OK. Uh, so uh, my question is, uh, I want to know what, what is the general condition of the uh, general situation of labor union in Guangzhou? Because as far as I heard from my acquaintance in Indonesia, like they have uh, several networks in, in Korea, but unfortunately mostly in Seoul. But you already have mentioned in your writing, uh, like 
mostly the solidarity is uh, so centered. That's how it's actually uh, the condition and situation that labor union in Guangzhou is. And also uh, the second one, and how is the connection of the labor unions movement with other movement in Guangzhou, like student movement and other movements and maybe feminist movement in here and also like, uh, I mean, since the migrant worker here, they have like stereotyping uh, with 3D, uh, 3D work as dirty, uh, dangerous and demeaning works. So how, how it, uh, how it, uh, that's how, how the stereotyping uh, works uh, when you're working as a lawyer for the uh, migrant workers and uh, to connect the solidarity uh, borderless uh, uh, into the regional uh, scales and with other movements. Thank you. Yeah, let me leave up the, all the questions. Uh, we only have 15 minutes. <laughs> we have to wrap up our session. I'll be 10.45? Yeah. Um, there are two questions for uh, lawyer Suwali, uh, mostly about the uh, uh, immigrant workers. And um, the answer has to, has to be given by James. Uh, from Myanmar situation and Thailand situation. And Shiba needs to uh, reply uh, to yeah, questions. Mostly about the, I think, role of civic space, civil society, the role of civil society in Iran. Yeah. And I think would be better uh, to answer for the first as Suali, yeah. Okay. 일단은 Shiba님의 발표를 엄청나게 잘 들었고요. 네, 이란의 상황에 대해서 깊은 연대의 마음을 보냅니다. 네, 그리고 저는 Shiba님의 발 답변을 더 많이 듣고 싶어서. 저의 답은 짧게 드리겠습니다. 개인적으로 따로 답을 드릴 수 있을 것 같습니다. 인도 이 동티모르와 파키스탄 노동자가 어떻게 동행에 연결되냐? 동행에 연결될 수 있는 이유는 많은 지역에 그 당사자들의 목소리를 들으려고 옆에 있는 활동가들이 있으니까 그 활동가들이 이런 상황이 발생했다는 걸 가장 먼저 알고 저희에게 연결이 되는 것입니다. 저희가 직접 이렇게 바로 뭔가 상담이 오시는 게 아니고 뭐 그분이 노조의 활동가일 수도 있고요. 아니면 어느 쉼터의 활동가일 수도 있고 이주 노동자 쉼터의 활동가일 수도 있고 아무튼 그렇게 어딘가에 있는 활동가들에게 어떤 그 법적인 문제가 영 보고가 됐을 때 그게 그 활동가가 혼자서 하기가 어려운 일이면 저희에게 연대해 달라라고 요청이 와서 함께 하는 것입니다. 그리고 더 구체적인 방법은 따로 말씀드리고요. 노조와 관련돼서 노조가 네 대한민국의 노조의 요거는 정말 복잡한데요. 간단히 말씀드리면 크게 삼별 노조로 민주노총과 한국노총이 있습니다. 민주노총이 민주라는 말이 들어갔기 때문에 더 민주적이겠죠. 민주노총이 각 지역의 지부가 있습니다. 민주노총 광주 전남 지역 본부 또 민주노총 강, 광주 전남 지역 본부에 각 분야별로 예를 들어서 금속 노조, 공공 운수 노조, 또 이제 제가 기억나는 게그 정도밖에 없네요. 그렇게 각 분야별로 이제 또 노조 파트가 있고요. 각 지역 본부에 상근하는 활동가들이 있습니다. 그리고 뭐 농협 노조, 뭐각 여러 가지 노조들이 있는데요. 지금 현재 어, 이주민 노조가 별도로 설립되어 있지 않습니다. 지역에는요. 
서울을 중심으로 되어 이제 만들어가고 있고 하는데 지역에는 없는 가운데 지역에 있는 노동조합 활동가들이 이주민, 이주노동자 만국의 노동자여 단결하라 하는 이런 기치 가운데 어, 이주노동자도 함께 이주, 노동자로서 함께 하고자 하는 연대 활동을 하는 것이고요. 그런 맥락에서 이제 노동과 관련된 이슈가 다른 페미니즘이나 뭐 다른 뭐 장애인권이나 이렇게 어떻게 연결이 되느냐 하는데 어, 각 사안별로 함께 연대해야 할 상황이 발생을 하면 예를 들어서 장애와 관련된 어, 장애인 노동용 착취 사건이 발생을 해서 기자회견을 할때 장애인권 단체만 오지 않습니다. 뭐 노동조합에도 연락을 하고 여성 단체도 연락을 하고 그러면 그런 그렇게 연락을 해서 어떤 개개의 문제에 함께 연대해 달라라고 하면 그 문제에 같이 어, 모여서 이야기를 하고 투쟁하고 <웃음> 집회하고 그런 식으로 지역의 인권 여러 분야의 각 분야의 인권 어, 거, 뭔가 주제들이 그렇게 엮어집니다. 그럴 수 있었던 거는 어, 아무래도 광주의 5.18, 1980년 5.18의 경험이 있기 때문에 더 조직적으로 움직일 수 있는 부분이 있고요. 근데 이제 그러면 광주만 그렇게 각 분야별로 연대하냐? 그건 아니고 이제 어, 한국이 상대적으로 민주주의와 관련된 여러 가지 주제가 주제별로 더 발전할 수 있는 상황이어서 각 주제의 활동가들이 연합하는 그런 것들이 더 기회가 있습니다. 이 네, 정도로 답하겠습니다. 넥스트 쉬바 Thank you for all your question. Uh, one of the question about the regime change, I want to start from there. People in Iran during the last year, almost eight months ago, they were protesting to change the fundamental situation in Iran. But some group from the previous uh, government that they call monarchists, and we saw them in around the world. They try to change these protests as a demand of regime change. And even one of their promoters always they say, we want regime change, we want regime change. But people in Iran doesn't want regime change in the context that they say. They want the fundamental change. It's very different with the regime change. Actually, regime change is something against the people that they are protesting and losing their lives in Iran. Because, as I say, uh, some Western country, uh, these monarchist group, they have, a, uh, they have money, they have support, they have support of the Western country, they have media, and they have lots of voice. But in the reality, they are not like uh, those that people fighting with. But they try to show that people want them to be back. But the situation and discrimination that people from Iran faced with is not start with this revolution. It has been started, I mentioned in my uh, presentation, it has started since uh, 90, uh, 1926. Therefore, we should listen to voice of people in Iran, not those that come from the mass media. One of the criticisms that actually I had it against, like the people that they are fighting for the human right, it was exactly this, because human right was not success in taking equality among other reasons. They have a, let's, I have some reason, but I want to mention this one specifically. It's because it has been more engaged with promoting and addressing one of them, like civil political rights, and they try, like some, not like consciously, but in reality, they neglecting social and economic right. And other thing, the public and human rights organization do not 
know about the situation in Iran or what they know is through the mainstream media. Uh, refining the per uh, perception of an, and understanding of the situation in Iran, it is very important in the first step that must be taken towards solidarity with the Iranian people and international solidarity for the human rights. People in Iran need solidarity. Need, they need progressive solidarity. People in Iran doesn't have, doesn't believe any like a, a kind of. Um, we have some kind of like United Nations, for example. Last week they announced something. I have a document of that. I can share it with you. That's something that is very important. They announced a person from the government in Iran. They nominated him. They nominated Iran with all these uh, human rights that they are not covered. They are not protected. They all about these things happened only during this one year. But the, United Nations nominated Iran as a uh, like a representative for the social and economic one, like a position in the United Nations. And this is very disappointing for people in Iran. Because people in Iran, they are expecting solidarity. But in the otherwise Western country, try to bring someone from Western country that they, he or whatever, they are not in Iran, they want to bring back and put it in the power, and people, they are suffering from the same situation. They don't want to change the face of the, like a leader, they want the fundamental change. And other question, actually, it is like related to this. We have some reformist group in Iran too that people are fighting against them because it is some scenario it has been coming up that those reformists they try to like change the regime with the reformists still the same for the people people are not happy with that people try to fight to like uh, down to up they don't want someone come in the up and like power and govern everything without have any like understanding of the those oppression that people faced with. And for the solidarity with Iran, I think it's very important, for example, condemn this pointing of the United Nations. It's very, very important because it is like some kind of honor for Iran. Iran say in the, all the media that, yeah, I'm killing my people, but United Nations nominated me as a human rights representative. This is something like unacceptable. It's important to so stay in solidarity with Iran and echo the voice of people in Iran. People try to find their leader inside in Iran, not outside of the country. I think maybe I cover all questions. If I miss something, I'll be happy to answer. For the, yeah, thank you for the answer. Uh, Mr. James Hinan, answer. Just briefly, um, on human rights defenders and DPRK, so there's those inside the country and those outside the country. For those inside the country, we don't even really know who they are because the country is entirely closed, particularly for the last three years. We know they exist, we know they take great risk in standing up for the rights of others, but there's very low knowledge of human rights in DPRK. So one of the challenges for the human rights community is to increase awareness of human rights in DPRK. Um, it's a very difficult question because it involves big do no harm aspects. Do, 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 you, do you send in copies of the human rights treaties in Korea and if they get found, they could put the person in a huge amount of personal danger. So, so for those inside, no, I can't say there's been that much. We know there's been some changes, positive changes, small positive changes. We know that young people are at the forefront of standing up against some things, for example, the consumption of foreign media, but we really don't know a lot what's happening there now. For human rights defenders on DPRK issues outside, um, there's been a lot of progress here in the Republic of Korea. Those standing up for North Koreans here uh, uh, have seen a whole 
yeah, I think I've seen quite some change. In the past, they were treated with suspicion. The families were harassed by the authorities because of supposed links with the North. Um, that whole, there's still a long way to go in ROK in, in facing up to that, but the, I mean, my co the Koreans here will know more than me. I think the situation has improved uh, significantly. In other countries, if you're trying to help escapees in hiding in China, it's a more difficult place to be working. Um, so it's a mixed bag. I can't say that there's been, we can talk about huge, huge uh, moves forward. Um, on Thailand, yeah, the use of online abuse against human rights defenders is one of the new phenomena, not new, but it's, it's a growing phenomena and there's been a lot said about it. What I, in my experience, what happens is that you raise it with the government and the government says, absolutely, that's why we have to police the internet and they use human rights to actually limit voices, legitimate voices, voices of human rights defenders on the internet. So it's a very tricky story with the government, but but we see so many examples now of rather than human rights defenders being arrested and jailed, they don't get touched, but other groups aligned with the authorities will attack them. At, at best online, at worst physically in the street. Um, yeah, this is, this is something that's used in many, many countries. The office in Bangkok, can help you, and we can talk about that afterwards. The special rapporteurs can help you, human rights defenders, but also those in theme. So if it's a question of women's rights or disability, special rapporteur on freedom of expression, there's, there's many mechanisms there that you can use. But ultimately, it should be the national human rights institution that is taking up this issue. Um, I know Thailand's been through a difficult decade, but the national institution is the first stop and they should be helping you. If they're not, then the, then the international community should be pushing the national mechanisms. Again, the UN's not there to come in and fix everything. The UN's there as a last resort, but I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. I also note that on Iran, absolutely, the High Commissioner issued a very strong statement uh, last week, was it last week, on, on the executions, shocking numbers of executions in Iran. I'm sorry uh, not to have more time for the further uh, question and uh, the fruitful discussion, uh, such as uh, the role of civic area, the role of uh, civil society, uh, the role of judiciary system. Uh, we need more. Uh, discussion and there might be m further questions but unfortunately I have to wrap up our session for the uh, next uh, session um, is there anyone to talk before wrapping up our session only one Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'd better to wrap up our session. Uh, thank you for all. Uh, keynote speaker, uh, High Commissioner uh, Berko Trick, and the wonderful three panelists uh, who gave us a wonderful presentation, especially audience on the floor, uh, on online and and offline. And also, I'd like to thank STEP to uh, help us working behind the stage. Thank you so much again. Yeah.